So this is specifically for humans, where are the autosomal characteristics carry? And with 23 pairs of chromosomes, the autosomal chromosomes are 1 through 22. Pairs, 1 through 22. Pair 1, pair 2, pair 3, pair 4, et cetera, through 22. <coughs> Does anybody remember on humans where sex-linked traits are carried? Where are the sex chromosomes? The 23rd. So this will be the 23rd pair. Oops. So that would be the X and the Y chromosomes are the 23rd pair. Morning. Okay, number two, what chromosomal abnormalities associate with Down syndrome? Sorry? 21. How many 21s? Three. So this is trisomy 21, which means there's three 21st chromosomes. You guys, make sure that you can recognize that on a karyotype. Speaking of a karyotype, number three, how can you tell the sex of an individual in a karyotype? Okay, so Danella said you look at the last pair, and they're going to be on the lower right-hand side. What if you see two big chromosomes? What have you got? That's a girl. What if you see one big chromosome and then a really small chromosome? That's a boy. Because what's that really small chromosome? It's the Y. It's not shaped like a Y, it's shaped like an X, but it's really small, and we call it the Y chromosome. Okay, so this would be female, and this would be male. Okay, number four, what chromosomal abnormalities are associated with, and I have the four of them here. Now, guys, just in case you don't remember these, we did go over these four already in our lab manual, page 125. So if you need a reference on this, page 125 is really good in your lab manual. So what chromosomal abnormalities associate with Turner's? Only one X. So we show that X, O. Would that person be male or female? A female, that's good. Okay, what chromosomal abnormality is associated with poly X? Three X's. Again, another female. How about Klein Felters? Good. Nick said two X's and one Y. What about that person, male or female? That'd be male. Okay, Jacobs? X and two Ys. And again, a male. Be able to recognize karyotypes for those. You may recall we practiced that on page 125. So expect to see some karyotypes on the lab test, and you have to figure out what the karyotype goes with, what disorder. Okay, if a person is homozygous dominant, and that means big A, big A, or they're heterozygous, that means big A, little a. What characteristic will show in their phenotype? Will they look dominant or will they look recessive? For sure, they're going to look dominant, yes. That one's easy, right? Renee said yes. Okay, next part. If an individual is homozygous recessive, which is little a, little a, what trait will show in their phenotype? Recessive. Very good. There's Danella said recessive. Are you okay on that? Number six, you would expect the dominant trait to be the most common trait in a population. Is this always true? No. 
Now that we've been studying evolution, can you think of a reason or more why the <coughs> dominant wouldn't always be the most common? Natural selection. So the recessive trait may actually give an advantage to the individual in a specific environment. So it might be just due to natural selection. It could be natural selection. Another thing it could be, we just started talking about this idea the other day, it could be the founder effect. You guys remember the founder effect? That's where a few individuals start a whole new population. I remember showing you a chart the other day where there were some uh, populations of humans that only had blood type O. You guys remember that? That's all they have. And O is recessive. So that's a good example of why you might see the recessive trait more often than the dominant. It might be the, the individuals that started the population only had the recessive trait. Okay, number seven. If given information about which trait is dominant and which trait is recessive, be able to work genetics problems. So let me give you some examples of what you should be able to work. In your lab manual, we worked problems together starting on page 127. And we went all the way to page 130, working selected problems. So I would go back and review those problems. They're just very easy genetics problems. You just need to ref refresh your memory on them. Okay, so I just made up one. If you'll glance up at the screen, I just made up a question. Uh, two people have widow's peaks. And uh, widow's peak, does anybody remember, is widow's peak dominant or recessive? Dominant. It is dominant. Okay, so two people with widow's peaks have three children. Two of their children do have widow's peaks. One of their children have a straight hairline. What are the genotypes for each? So let's start with the two people that got together and started having kids, okay? Using the letter capital W for widow's peak and lowercase w for a straight hairline, tell me about these first two people that mated. What are they? Capital W. And what about the other one? The same. That's good. Okay, now let's talk about their kids. Let's start with the two that have widow's peaks. What are their genotypes? It could be the same as the parents, or it could be capital W, capital W. Couldn't it be capital W, capital W? Okay, what about the kid with the straight hairline? Lowercase w, lowercase w. Sarah, here's a review sheet. You may have a question about that question. Madeline, did you get a review seat? Review sheet? Yeah. And Haley, you got one? Okay. Okay, so that would be an example of what I would put on a test. It's just problem solving. Yes? It's okay with that? Great. Oh, we did that. Okay, number eight, true or false. Sex chromosomes carry only genes that relate to the sexual characteristics or sexual functions of an individual. So your X and Y chromosomes only carry things that have sexual traits. You got any other genes on there that are non-sexual? True or false? What? I don't know. Tell me. Is my X chromosome only loaded with sex traits? No. So would this be true or false? False. Okay, now my X chromosome, everybody in the room has one, males or females. I have two, the gentlemen have one. How are X linked traits, that means traits that are only found on the X chromosome, how are they inherited differently in males and females? Okay, now I want to remind you these traits are things like color blindness, hemophilia, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Do they show up more often in males or females? Males, yes. So usually the males show the trait. What about the females? What do they do? They carry it, good.
Okay, pedigrees. Let's uh, glance over to pedigrees, and this is page 130 and page 131. Does a pedigree show genotypes or phenotypes? It shows genotypes? It shows phenotypes? Make up your mind. It show what a person's appearance is, or does it show their actual genes? It shows their genes? Then how come some of these people we have question marks on? Didn't we put question marks on some of these people? Yes, we did. I see one on page 131, pedigree number two. We couldn't figure out generation two, individual eight. We had a question mark on part of her. So it doesn't show genotypes, it shows phenotypes. Now, from that, we try and figure out the genotypes, but can you always? No, you can't always. Sometimes you can, but you can't always. So pedigrees show phenotypes. Now, real quickly, on a pedigree, what does a circle represent? A female. How about a square? And what if you link them? <coughs> what does that mean if they're linked? They're mating partners. Okay, what does it mean if you color it in? They have the disorder that you're studying. Are they okay on that? Super. So I made up a pedigree. And I colored in the affected individuals with blue. And you may recall in a pedigree, the very first thing you have to do is figure out what kind of disorder it is. And page 131 are your choices. If I take a look at the top table, page 131 in your lab manual. Sarah, do you have a lab manual? You want to borrow a lab manual? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have these choices here, and you guys can figure out which one you think is uh, the right choice. Autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, or X-linked recessive. Okay, Sarah's nominated autosomal recessive. Let's look at the clues for autosomal recessive. If neither parent, I'm mean, sorry, neither parent is affected, and that's true, and then only a few of their children are. You'll notice that these two people had three children and only one of their three children have the disorder. So what do you think about Sarah's nomination, autosomal recessive? I agree, autosomal recessive. Now, just using the letter A, let's see if we can figure out some of the genotypes. Let's uh, try to do genotype for uh, generation one, individual one, the original mother. Use the letter A. I'm ready. <clears throat> I heard big A, little A. Does everybody agree? Okay, how about her, her spouse? Same thing. Okay, let's talk about their firstborn daughter. That's generation two, individual two. I'm ready. Big A. It's got to be big A, little A. Who told you that? the third kid that told you that. It's that kid right here. Because look at generation three, individual three. What's that genotype? Little a, little a. Yes? It's okay on that? Okay, great. All right, so make sure you review these um, pedigrees. And there's two here on page 131 that would be good to review. All right, then I'm going to number 11. Susan has blood type A, and Jack has blood type AB. What are the possible blood types of their children? Well, guys, let's just go ahead and do a Punnett square. Let's start with Susan. What do you want me to write down for the genotype of Susan? AA? AO. Always assume they're heterozygous because we're not sure. 
So just assume that they're carrying a recessive gene. That way you've got your bases covered. Okay, how about Jack? What do you want me to write for him? I'm ready. A, B. So we've got a kid that could be A. We've got a kid that could be A, B. We've got a kid that could be A. We've got a kid that could be B. So the answer is A comma B comma A B. Could Susan and Jack have a baby blood type O? No. Jack messed that up. I want you guys to remember A and B are both dominant. What about O? It's recessive. That's good. All right, let's glance back at 1 through 11. Ready, okay? All right, super. I'm moving ahead to exercise 11 on DNA biology and technology. And so I'm supposed to define these three words. I'll get us started with replication. That's where DNA is used to make more DNA. Correct? DNA replication, DNA is used to make more DNA. You guys remember that word? It's been a few weeks. Okay, how about transcription? Anybody? Yep, DNA is used to make RNA. That's transcription, where you make RNA using the information of DNA. Okay, our last word is translation. Anyone help me with translation? That's good. Taking the information from RNA and making an amino acid sequence from it. That's translation. Ready, okay on that? Okay, great. There it is. You guys may remember this one. This is uh, the whole thing. So looking at this, let's talk about what arrow number one is. What's arrow number one? Replication. What's arrow number two? Transcription. What's arrow number three? Hold on. Earlier I put amino acid sequence there. Why do I have the word protein now? Because that's what proteins are made out of. Everybody okay with that? Super. Okay, I need the three parts of a DNA nucleotide. Now I want to give you a little visual here to kind of um, push your brain forward. Page 136. And actually, in the little box that's called letter A, there's two nucleotides there, a G nucleotide and a C nucleotide. You guys see them? So we've got to do the three parts of a nucleotide. Go ahead and get me started. Say it again. A base. A sugar. Oops, it's supposed to be a base. Need one more part. A phosphate. Very good. So it's phosphate, sugar, and base. Now, if you're doing DNA, what is the sugar? Very good. Montana said deoxyribose is the sugar in DNA. Now, if you're doing DNA, what are the bases? A, T, G, and C. That's good. So 
So what base is missing from DNA? U. There's no U in DNA. Ready? Okay? Good. Okay, so speaking of these nucleotides, and again, page 136 is a nice visual. We could say that DNA kind of looks like a ladder. And look, guys, we built DNA one day. This is what we built. And I think it looks like a ladder, especially if you untwist it and it's flat like this one is. Does it look like a ladder? Okay. Hey, Miguel. And so if you pretend, here you go, Miguel and Mark. If you pretend that DNA is like a ladder, what parts of DNA make up the sides of the ladder? The sugar and the phosphate. Good. And what makes up the ladder rungs? And if you don't know that word, it means steps. The bases. And I'm going to write down base pairs. How come it's a pair? Because C always goes with G, and T always goes with A. And how are they held together? Hydrogen bonds. That's good. Hydrogen bonds. Again, page 136 is a really nice picture of that in your lab manual, page 136. Okay, so I took a picture of this. You guys see it okay? I want you to help me label it. Okay, so let's start with this top white arrow that's on this white tube. What do you think that is? It's phosphate, good. Okay, how about, come on down, the next white arrow is on a black pentagon. Sugar will not be a choice on your test. Very good, deoxyribose. Okay, now, we can't sp say specifically right now, but what about all of these colored tubes, like the one with the blue arrow on it? What would that be? The base. Mm-hmm. Now, everybody look at the picture. If I told you that the black base was A, then what would be the blue base? T. T. Okay, good. And then lastly, I don't know if you can see, I've got one more arrow right there in something that's holding the two sides together. What would that be? Hydrogen bonds. Good. Everybody okay on my little picture there? And the reason I have a picture is because it's on the test. This model's on the test, okay? Great. Maybe you have pictures, too, that you took. Okay, number three says, if I give you a sequence of DNA, you have to be able to predict the base sequence on the new strand. So I thought we could practice. But you just practice this one. Practice, just for, for fun, just practice. Are you finished? All right, so go ahead and get me started. This has three primes, so what would go here? Five, good. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <coughs> three prime. It's okay on that. Mm -hmm. So DNA strands run anti-parallel, so one is going 5' prime to 3' prime this way, and one is going 5' prime to 3' prime this way. All the latter thing is, it, is the side with the white tube, is that the 3' prime? 
five. Good question. So uh, Nick remembers in class that we could tell the five prime in because we had a phosphate hanging off of it. And he could tell the three prime in because we didn't. It would end with a black deoxyribose. That's good remembrance. So let me just back up to that picture. So this would be the five prime end. And this would be the three prime end of that particular uh, piece. So everybody see what Nick was remembering? Okay. Okay. Okay, I need differences in structure and differences in composition between DNA and RNA. Now here's what you guys already told me. The DNA has T, but RNA doesn't. Instead, RNA has U. And you guys already told me DNA has deoxyribose, but RNA doesn't. What does RNA have? Just ribose. And then what else? I need something else. There's one more thing. Good. So DNA is double-stranded. You can always spot DNA because it's double-stranded. And RNA is single-stranded. Everybody remember that okay? Yes? Super. So, first of all, what do I have a picture of up here? This is RNA. How'd you know? Single strand. Single strand. So, super. So, let's talk about some of the parts. So, like, what about these tubes that are colored? The blues, the reds, the blacks, what are they? Sorry? Well, in general, what are they? Their bases. That's good. So the color tube or the bases. How about the white tubes? Phosphate. Just like before, the white tubes are phosphate. And how about the blue pentagons? Ribose. And you guys said that this was RNA. RNA. That's RNA. RNA. Everybody okay on that? So that model will also be on your test. Okay. Okay, guys, so in your notes somewhere, you should have a piece of paper that's called the genetic code. Can we dig that out? The genetic code. Is there anyone who does not have their genetic code? Come on up. And so the genetic code has these sequences of three bases <coughs> that are called codons. So that's where we're at right now is what is a codon? So I'll get us started. A codon is a sequence of three messenger RNA bases. Like AUG would be a codon. UUU would be a codon. You okay on what a codon is? Okay, what is the function of a codon? Like what's it code for? Very good, Miguel. Miguel Martinez said it codes for amino acids. Each codon codes for an amino acid. Now, when we're using the genetic code or when the cell is using the messenger RNA to do amino acid sequencing, what process, what process is the cell doing? 
using mRNA to make an amino acid sequence. What process is that? Translation. Translation. Okay, so now here's the question. What organelle in a cell is associated with translation? Like there's this organelle that makes translation happen. Nobody. I'll help you out. It starts with the letter R. There it is. There it is, the ribosome, the protein kitchen. Now, just to make sure you can do it, I've got a little piece of, um, well, you tell me, what do I have a little piece of up here? That's not messenger RNA. Look again. DNA. That's DNA. Mm -hmm. Cyronelli's right. How come it's DNA? There's T's. Everybody see the T's? So when I tell you to transcribe this piece of DNA, what am I asking you to make? RNA. So everybody get started. Try that. Okay, would you help me? Go ahead. I need a three or a five. Go ahead. How come it's not ATG? Because we're making RNA. You got to switch your mind around. When I ask you to transcribe, I'm asking you to make RNA. So there's no T's in RNA. Okay, what's the next one? Good. Next one. UA what? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so each one of these little sequences of three would be called a codon. This is a codon. But okay, on codon. Good. Okay, so I got a picture up here. First of all, what is the big blue thing right here? The big blue thing. That's the ribosome. That's correct. The ribosome. I'm going to get lighter. Okay, what is this whole molecule that's made out of white tubes, blue pentagons, and colored rods? It is. What kind of RNA? mRNA. mRNA. That's good. Okay, and then what is this whole thing down at the bottom that's made out of this funky blue looking thing? It's got three colored tubes and a black thing <coughs> hanging off the bottom. There's the anticodon. And what's the whole molecule called? T tRNA. This thing's the tRNA. It's the tRNA. Okay, on this tRNA, and you can pick any tRNA you want, let's just talk about the parts. I'm going to circle just these three bases on this tRNA. What's the name of those three bases? That's the anticodon. That's the anticodon. And what about this black thing that's hanging on the bottom? It's an amino acid. It's an amino acid. So there's a bigger view of it. So what's this whole thing, the whole screen? What is that? tRNA. Okay, and then again, what are these three bases at the top? Anticodon. And the black thing at the bottom? Amino acid. Because you remember, transfer RNA takes amino acids to the ribosome. Just reverse and look. See how the ribosome there? There's the ribosome. And transfer RNA brings the amino acids to the ribosome. Um, one more time, let me ask you this. What process 
is being illustrated by this whole picture. Trans, make up your mind. We've got two transes going on here. Transcription or translation? Which one do you want? This one's transcription. Nope, that's a lie. This one's translation. If you pick translation, you were right. And again, I remember doing this on your tabletops with you, and again, I was encouraging you to take pictures. I don't know if you did, but you might have some of these pictures on your cell phone. Okay. All right, now number seven goes with the previous picture. What two components necessary for translation are carried by the tRNA? Well, it's the anticodon <coughs> and the amino acid. Guys, can I use AA for amino acid? Is that okay? So then that begs the question of, well, what is an anticodon? Will everybody agree an anticodon is three bases and it's on a tRNA? But what about those three bases? Are they just any three bases or are they a specific three base? Like if I gave you a codon, could you give me the anticodon? Sure. Is the anticodon exactly like the codon? No. What is it? It's the opposite, or we call it complementary, complementary. So I'm going to write this down. These are three bases complementary to a codon. And again, an anticodon means you're working on tRNA. Anticodon goes with tRNA. Anticodon, tRNA. What does codon go with? mRNA. Codon goes with mRNA. Anticodon goes with tRNA. Okay, so I thought it'd be fun for us to practice this. Okay, so I gave you codons. First of all, how do you know this is RNA that I gave you? It's got U's. You're on fire, so I don't know. You can tell. It's got U's. So I gave you some codons. So let's practice some anticodons. Go ahead and give me the first anticodon. Do you see what? G. Good. But okay on that first anticodon? Okay, how about the next anticodon? I'm ready. Good. Who has a question about getting anticodons? Okay, what molecule would have codons? mRNA. What molecule would have anticodons? tRNA. Good. All right, so you have your genetic code. I've given you a piece of mRNA, and I want you to translate it. What does that mean, translate it? Amino acids. So we're looking for the amino acids. And, guys, let's just use three-letter abbreviations here for each amino acid. Um, yeah, I just added some extra stuff just to practice our skills. Okay, so what amino acid did you get for AUG? Met? Yeah. MET? Methionine? Yeah. Okay, let's talk, try the second code on CGC. ARG? Yep, that's what I see. It's arginine. You guys, I am going to link them together because they would be linked together with a covalent bond called a peptide bond. They will be linked together with a covalent bond called a peptide bond. Okay, let's try UAU. TYR. Tyrosine. Oh, UAG is stop. It sure is. <laughs> but okay, I'm doing translation. Okay, so you'll have to translate on the lab test next week. Great. And you'll be given this chart. This chart's on the test, just like it was on the lecture test. Okay, great. 
All right, so one day, everybody, we did an activity where we did not use our lab manual. Instead, there was a handout that was called electrophoresis. Let's all open up our uh, whatevers to find the piece of paper. It's called electrophoresis, electrophoresis. It's the day we were working with the gels and uh, putting pigments and proteins in the gels. Now, the first thing I'd like to do is flip it on the back, because you took notes on the back. I think you drew a test tube, and we labeled the notes on the back DNA isolation. So that's what I'm talking about for right now. Now, if you weren't here, you definitely want to see someone who was here and get those notes from them after class. Okay, so DNA isolation. I need to know what role each component played. And the first thing was the banana, which was the banana cell extract. It was banana. Can anybody tell me what role did the banana play in the DNA isolation? It was the source of what? Good. Okay, then SDS was a detergent, a detergent. What role did the, did the detergent play in this isolation? Tell me again. Mm -hmm. Sarah's correct. It broke down cell membranes. And then lastly, we added some cold ethanol. What role did the ethanol play? Should be just right there in your notes. Attracted the DNA. Mm -hmm. It made it separate the DNA out. That's what accomplished our separation. So each of those three components were very important for getting DNA out of the test tube. But okay on that one. All right, super. So let's go back to the front of that handout, and we're looking for what gel electrophoresis is used for. And I think it's the very first sentence on the front of that handout. Gel electrophoresis separates molecules. So it's used to separate molecules. Right, see where I'm getting this from the first sentence. Keep reading on the first sentence. Upon what basis does gel electrophoresis separate molecules? Charge, I heard charge, anything else? And size. So um, let me remind you that positive things move negative, negative things move positive. Shake your head. Big things don't move very far. Little things move very far. Okay, what makes the molecules actually migrate or move? Okay, there's a reason why the word electro is in the word electrophoresis. What makes the molecules move? Electricity. You've got to have electricity. They are not going to move if you don't have any electricity. Okay, lastly, on the front page, I gave you some proteins, isoelectric points. It's on the front of it. And there's a paragraph right above that table that says each protein has an isoelectric point, the pH at which it has no charge at all. Does everybody see that? So I want you to go back and review that and be able to tell me if something was positive or negative if I give you the pH. We practice that. Now here's what I remember. I remember myoglobin and hemoglobin, we ran it at pH of 7, and it didn't move very much. Look at your data. Myoglobin and hemoglobin, it just didn't seem to move very much at all. Can anybody look at myoglobin and hemoglobin's isoelectric point and tell me why they didn't move very much? Okay. 
What do you notice about myoglobins he, isoelectric point and hemoglobins isoelectric point relative to the pH of 7? They're very close. So would these two have very much charge? No. So would they move? Not much. Okay, that was number 11, and we're going to go to the back. Yes, ma'am? Yeah, so you can look at that table at pH of 7 and those isoelectric points, and you can tell myoglobin and hemoglobin, they wouldn't move very much, but serum albumin would and cytochrome C would. See how far away from 7 they are? Yeah, so they're going to have some nice charge, and they're going to move. And I think our data support that. So if you're a protein with an isoelectric point close to the pH of the buffer, you're not going to move because you don't have any charge. Okay, so I gave us an example to practice that. Right, take a look. The buffer is 7. Right, see, I put it at the bottom. And then I ran these. Uh, let's say that they were pigments because... Um, well, no proteins, but they're colored so you can see them. Okay, first of all, how, uh, which of these uh, proteins are positively charged? One in five. How come? They move negative. Okay, so what about two, three, and four? What are they? Negatively charged. Okay, now look at two, three, and four. Out of 2, 3, and 4, which one had an isoelectric point closest to the buffer? 4. And which one had one farthest from the buffer? 2. See how easy that is? Right? Shake your head. <laughs> That's just easy. <laughs> Okie dokie then. We are truly on the back now. Okay, evolution. Here's what you're going to find on the test for evolution. This could be the lab test or the final exam. This is our definition of evolution. It's the genetic change in populations. We're looking for genetic changes in populations. Genetic changes in populations. <laughs> populations genetically change. Individuals do not, but populations do. And generally, it takes a bit of time to see this change. And I'm going to give you some examples in the next couple of days to show you that, that evolution can also occur very quickly. You can get a genetic change in a population really fast. Mm -hmm. Yes. It could be a short time. It could be a long time. I think we've seen this definition before. Okay. How does evolution explain the unity of life? Like, why is it all cells have DNA, messenger RNA, transfer RNA, rRNA? All cells have the same genetic code, the same amino acids, mostly the same proteins. How come? How come there's so much unity of life? Good. Because all life has common ancestry. But hold up, that life is very different. Just living on Earth today, we have over 2 million species. How can evolution explain that? How come there are so many different kinds of insects or so many different kinds of birds or so many different kinds of plants? How come? Say it again. Natural selection. So that has something to do with nature. So are all environments the same? Yes or no? No. no. There's probably thousands of different types of environments, maybe hundreds of thousands of different types of environments. So wouldn't you agree that organisms have adapted to different environments? I agree, too.
But okay on that one? Super. Okay, in our lab manual, Paleozoic, in case you don't remember, page 150. Page 150. It's a great reference page for this. I hope you wrote it down. Paleozoic. Anybody? Ancient life. That's good. How about Mesozoic? Middle life. That's good. Cenozoic. Recent life. Again, this is page 150. So that day that we talked about such things, we did fossils. You need to grab your fossil sheet out. Make sure you have your fossil sheet. So fossils 1 through 12 will be on your lab test. And you have to know their common name and their era. Make sure you have your fossil sheet. Now, guys, I want to remind you that I have a PowerPoint on Blackboard under course content that ha <coughs> excuse me that has all the pictures of the fossils if you'd like to look at those pictures but okay on the fossil sheet okay okay so now we're going to go to a vocabulary word and if you don't know this word you can find it on page 154 it's homologous Homologous. I see H O M O. What does homologous mean? Same. And in this use, it's the same basic structure. If you find the same basic structure in two organisms, you can tell that they're closely related. And we used our skulls in the back to illustrate that. I'm just glancing back there, back behind Patricia. I can see the goat and the sheep. Man, they look similar, don't they? They have, they have much homology. They're very homologous. They have many of the same basic structures. That means that they have recent common ancestry. But account homologous. Okay, analogous. Same page, page 154, the top of the page. What does analogous mean? Similar function. So like your legs could be compared to a grasshopper's legs. Why? Why are your legs like a grasshopper's legs? Not in structure, not built the same. Same function, walking. And I guess you could jump, some humans do. Okay, here's the big question. If you're trying to find evolutionary relationships, do you look for homologous or analogous structures? Homologous. Okay, that particular day, page 156, we compared human and chimpanzee skeletons. Okay, from here down, look, from the top of your neck down. Not, don't talk about your skull yet, just from here down. Why are human skeletons different than chimp skeletons? There's one reason why. We're standing up straight. That's called posture. We're using two legs to stand on, and they use four. Are you okay with that idea? Okay. Now, what about skulls? Well, we did skulls on page 158, and I think there's two reasons why chimp skulls look so different than human skulls. 
there's two reasons why. Let's talk about this part right here first. Why is ours right here so much different than theirs? Tell me again. Brain size. Brain size. We've got big brains. Might not use them, but they're there. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a difference right here. Remember, we're real flat looking right here, and theirs juts out right here. Why? <coughs> Mm -mm, right here. No. See how this is sticking out? The jaw. The jaw. Why? I know it's the jaw, but why is theirs sticking out like that and ours doesn't? What they eat. That's very good because they're herbivores. So di they're mostly herbivores. We talked about sometimes they will eat meat, but they're mostly herbivores. And everybody agrees that when you're eating plants, you're chewing all the time. So what do you develop right here? Big. There's the teeth. What else you need? Muscles. And big muscles need big bones. There you go. Good. All right, so I wanted to remind you, we got those animal skulls in the back. I also have a PowerPoint with pictures of the animal skulls on uh, Blackboard, so if you want to study those. And the animal skulls, you should know the animal skulls by name and then what their diet is. And so we looked at their teeth, and we could tell what they eat by their teeth. And what do I mean by diet? I'm going to ask you if they're an herbivore, a carnivore, or an omnivore. So let's say you're looking at a, a skull, and all the teeth, all the teeth are sharp. What does that mean? Carnivore. How about if you're looking at a at, at skull and you got some a few up here in the front, these in the front, and then in the back you have bunches of molars, but they're all ground down. That's a what? Mm. Herbivore. How come? They have to tear the plants in the front, and then what do they do with the plants in the back? Chew and chew and chew and chew. Okay, so what would an omnivore's teeth look like? like ours. That's good. So we have the front teeth for tearing and our back teeth are a little bit flat, especially some of those back there like the raccoon. I remember one side of the molar is a little bit sharp and the other side is flat. How clever is that? So it's a nice intermediate between the carnivore and the herbivore. Something in the middle, if you will. But it'll count the diet idea. Super. Okay, comparative embryology is on page 159. Now, guys, on page 159, we looked at those embryos, and we found five similarities. What I thought was more fun was the day in lecture where I showed you these embryos, and I gave you choices. We were trying to match up which animal went with it, each embryo. Were you very good at it? You were lousy at it. Yeah, lousy. I'm not very good at it either. How come embryos look so similar? Common ancestry. Very good. So if you have two embryos that look super, super similar, they must share common ancestry. So how does comparative embryology help determine relationships between organisms? Similar embryos mean common, recent common ancestry. Oops, that's supposed to have an E. Are okay on that? Oh, I love this question. Would you expect a human embryo to be more like a chicken embryo or more like a pig embryo? I agree, pig. How come? We're both mammals. Good job. So we have more recent common ancestry. But okay, on that question, great. What are some basic biochemical molecules that practically all organisms have in common? Well, if you're not sure, the top of page 160 might be useful. Can anybody get us started? 
chemicals in cells that all life has? RNA, RNA, I heard DNA. I'll add one that people forget about. This one's your buddy. Isn't ATP your buddy? ATP's my buddy. Mm -hmm. Those are some examples. And then we have many of the same enzymes, like DNA, um, polymerase or RNA polymerase or ATP synthase. We have many of the same enzymes. The real, real important enzymes. All life has those real, real important enzymes. How can this be explained that all life has the same basic chemicals? I'm ready. Common ancestry. When in doubt, pick Common ancestry seems to keep showing up in our notes today. Common ancestry. Okay, so one day we used some spot plates and we added liquid to the spot plates and we looked for cloudiness, white cloudiness. It was just last week. Do you remember that? And so this is the be able to determine the degree of relatedness based on the antibody-antigen reaction. If I asked you to find organisms that were most closely related, would you look for the most white cloudiness or the least white cloudiness? The most. And what if I asked you to find the organism that was least related? You look for the least cloudiness. Okay, okay on that one. Okay, Madeline said, so if you don't see much cloudiness in there, they're not very closely related. Okay, and then lastly for this activity, on the back of the fossils, there was this chart that we called the protein clock. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you should be able to uh, answer questions based on the protein clock. I'll give you the clock. Um, so just review the three questions that are at the bottom. Now just refresh your memory on how to use the protein clock. Pretty okay. Well, super. So last we met, we did exercise 13. Mechanisms of Evolution, and Exercise 13 starts on page 165, but these things you can find on page 166, and I'm just going to defer to page 166 because you guys can look up these um, vocabulary words, and if you don't want to look at them in your lab manual, you'll also find all of this in your lecture notes. We have all of these things in our lecture notes. So I'm going to go to number two, because I'm all about Hardy-Weinberg. This is last we met. Do you remember the purpose of Hardy-Weinberg? Baseline. Good. Baseline for evolutionary comparison. So you've got to know what the genes are at one point in time so you can find out if they've changed later on. Okay, great. Okay, in the absence of outside evolutionary agents, so I'm saying there's no evolution, how would you expect gene frequencies <coughs> of a large population to change over time? With no evolution going on, what would you expect to happen to P and Q? Nothing. Be no change. If nothing's causing evolution, then all the uh, gene frequencies, the P's, the Q's, all of that will stay the same. Oh, I love number three. Check this out. Number three, true or false. The frequency of the recessive phenotype in a population is how often you find 
recessive phenotype, you know, like blue eyes, equals the frequency of homozygous recessive genotype. That's true. As a matter of fact, that's what we call Q squared. Correct? It's okay. Super. All right, number four is true or false. So similar yet different. The frequency of the dominant phenotype, you know, how often you find, say, brown eyes, equals the frequency of homozygous dominant genotype. That's false. How come? Sure, you could be heterozygous and still show the dominant trait. So this one's false. This one's false. Okay, so guys, I was telling you this on Tuesday, and I really do mean it. You have to know what each symbol of the Hardy-Weinberg stands for. And this is on page 167, top of the page, under the word where. Does everybody see it? Maybe you already highlighted it. And everybody, time spent studying that will be useful because that will also be on your final exam. Okay. First on number six, when I tell you that something's obeying Hardy-Weinberg, that means that the population's in equilibrium. What's that mean, equilibrium? Balance. Balance. Okay, so here we go, number six. Given a set of genotypic frequencies from a generation of a population, what would you expect the frequencies to be in the next generation if the population is obeying Hardy-Weinberg? The same. The same which means there's no evolution occurring. We see Hardy-Weinberg staying the same. We know there's no evolution occurring. How about after five generations? The same. How about after ten generations? The same. If it's obeying Hardy-Weinberg, then it's in equilibrium. It will stay the same. No evolution is occurring. The same, the same, the same. Okay, so we're going to do a Hardy-Weinberg. You guys have calculators? If not, grab your cell phones. I came up with this Hardy-Weinberg to practice. Can you tell what's dominant up here, long or short wings? How do you know what's, uh, and I agree, how do you know? The capital W. Okay, I got 400 fruit, fruit flies. <coughs> I love those guys, fruit flies. 375 have long wings and 25 have short wings. And we have to do all the Hardy-Weinberg values. Okay, anybody have any ideas of how to get started? We got to start with Q squared. I'm ready. I'm ready. That's right, 25 divided by 400. So it's the number that have the recessive phenotype divided by the total of the population. What did you guys get on your calculator? 0.06. We're going two places behind the decimal. And if you like that in percent, that would be 6%. 6% of the population is recessive. All right, now we've got to do Q. What do we do now to get Q? Take the square root. So I need the square root of 0 0.06. 0 0.24.
0.24. So the frequency of the recessive allele is 0.24. Okay, now we need P. How do we get P? I got 0.76. Did you? All right, then if you got a square button on your calculator, we can get P squared. 0.57, and lastly, 2PQ I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, Brittany got point three six. Everybody else? Okay. Are you okay on Hardy Weinberg? So you have to do Hardy Weinberg. Remember, you can't can't use your cell phone. And unfortunately, all my calculators don't have square root <laughs> buttons, so you better take care of yourself and bring yourself a calculator on Tuesday. I don't know what you need to do to make that happen. Just make that happen. Okay. All right, founder effect and bottleneck. What's the difference? Okay, well, let me give you a scenario. There's a scenario. Okay, so we have an island that's made, been made... Out in the bay, it's called a dredge island in Galveston Bay. Remember I was telling you how they dug the Houston Ship Channel? And when you dig it out, you got to do something with the dirt. So they just piled it up out in the bay, and they made what we call dredge islands out there. Of course, if you go out there now, they're covered with all kinds of plant and animal vegetation. How did those plants and animals get there? How'd they get there? Like, let's start with the plants. How'd the plants get out there? God put it there? I mean, come on. How'd they get there? Water. Yeah, there's mostly the seeds. Mostly seeds would have taken them out there. Could have been wind. Could have been water. Could have been on the feet of birds. You know how birds land, and then they go fly somewhere else. Okay, so they migrated out there. Everybody agree with me? Okay, so if you went out there and you were looking at a particular species of plant, you might notice that out on the dredge island, that species is a little bit different than the ones here on the mainland. What do we call that? That's founder effect. Founder effect. Okay, with founder effect. Okay, now then I've been out there and I know that if you get off your boat and you haven't used an insect repellent, you can get swarmed by mosquitoes. And that's in the spring and the summertime and on to the fall. But if you go out there in the winter, there's hardly any mosquitoes. So you went from a large population to a very small population. What is that? Bottleneck. Are you okay with that? Lastly, what are some examples of natural selection pressures? And the reason I asked this question is one day you came to class and we worked on this activity. And it was where we were picking moths and squares out of little pans, little uh, cardboard pans or trays. So what are some pressures that nature puts on populations? Like what could kill you off? Say it again. A disaster, good, like floods. We have those around here, floods, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, freezes, droughts. Those are all great examples. Okay, I got one. What's that mean? You were eaten. Okay, predation means you were eaten. Are you okay with that? You don't want to be, but nobody does. Hello. Okay, and I got one more that's huge. 
Disease. Disease. <laughs> Those are big ones. Are you okay with that? Natural selection pressures? Okay, great. Do so you have a question about the tests? We are out of time, but I do want you to be well prepared for the test. When is the test? Tuesday. Tuesday. Wait, All right. Oh, how does selection affect Hardy-Weinberg frequencies? What is your opinion on that? How does natural selection affect Hardy-Weinberg? Would the Hardy-Weinberg values stay the same? No. Changes them. Thank you, Brittany. Anybody else? Okay, great.